found him in his room. I called his name and he didn't move. Kevin, get up. Kevin, wake up. In a minute, I touched him. I knew he was gone. And I just screamed, not my baby. Fentanyl is killing more Texans than ever before. They're passing them off as prescription drugs, Percocet, Adderall, Xanax, Oxy. They'll post something onto Snapchat, just kind of like a fast food restaurant. They put their menu up. You cannot tell the difference between a fake pill and a real pill. They don't look like the medical emergencies we used to make. This is like anybody everywhere. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. This is y'all's opportunity to learn what I wish I had known so that you don't end up like us. All it takes is one pill. It was one pill. It was one pill that killed him. One decision, one and done, one pill. To understand the fentanyl crisis, you have to hear the story of this curly-haired 14-year-old. Joshua Gillahan was an only child. Five in vitros, just to get this one baby. He was their miracle child. Yeah. Josh grew up loving dirt bikes and Little League and anything to do with water. He was just your normal kid. A kid who ran into some bumps along the way. When mom and dad caught Josh dabbling in marijuana, they got him counseling, took his phone away, even installed cameras to see who was coming over, hoping it was just a phase. And everything was going really good. The first week of school came, and um, he had a great first week at school. And I said, I think we've turned the corner. The next morning, Kim Gillahan was about to head out of town. This is the actual video from that day. At the last minute, I thought, Oh my gosh, I need to go say bye to Josh. And so I went upstairs and um, and I called his name and, and he didn't answer. I called his name again and he didn't answer again. Josh? And then I just reached down to kind of like, you know, jostle him. In a minute I touched him. I knew he was gone. Josh had taken what he thought was a Percocet pill. It wasn't. It was pure fentanyl. There was nothing else in his system um, except for fentanyl. Oh my God. He would never have taken that pill if he had known what was in it. And that's the point. You don't know. Nobody knows. The crisis has spiraled out of control. Over five years in Harris County, fentanyl-related deaths shot up 467%. And for victims 21 and under, it's more distressing, a 933% spike. Fentanyl is the deadliest drug on the market today. Robert Kennedy is with the Drug Enforcement Administration. 50 times more powerful than heroin, 100 times more powerful than morphine. The synthetic opioid binds to receptors in the brain to block out pain. It produces an incredible high and is highly addictive key to a drug trafficker's bottom line. If they get you hooked and you live, you'll be back. If you don't live, then they'll find another client. It only takes two milligrams to kill you. Think of just a few grains of salt. Illicit fentanyl is often pressed into counterfeit pills like oxycodone, Adderall, and Xanax that look nearly identical to the real thing. When we send our pills to the lab, Six out of 10 pills are coming back as lethal dosage of fentanyl. That's 60% of our pills. You're playing with your life, and there's a 60% chance that you'll end up losing. Overdose was 67. It's the scariest thing that, that I've run across in my 19 years. Paramedics with the Houston Fire Department see the crisis firsthand. All over the city, it's daily. Seconds always matter for first responders like Captain Michael Prigmore, but with fentanyl, the EMS supervisor says, it's even more of a race against the clock. It's extremely potent and it works really fast. You've got about five to seven minutes before the brain stops working. If we get there in that amount of time before they actually stop breathing completely, we can reverse it. 
But too often, the 911 calls end like this, a life taken too soon, like the Gillahan family's miracle child, Josh. You've chosen to make that moment public. Yeah. It's very hard to see. It is. Why choose to share it? I feel like that's, if I could have shown my son something like that, maybe that would have gotten through to him. We were like, we have this footage and we need to figure out how to use it so that we can wake people up. And that's why we're here tonight. Her wake up call is working. If you look at the young faces who come to hear Kim speak and watch in real time what illicit fentanyl can do. I saw people that were really engaged. I saw people that their minds were blown. And I think that it takes something like that to get through to people sometimes, it, to show the reality of it. One pill will kill. So where did the pill that killed Joshua come from? Most likely through here, the U.S.-Mexico border, where drug smugglers routinely dare federal agents in a game of catch me if you can. Roughly here through Laredo, we see about five to 6,000 vehicles per day. At border crossings like this one, it's a numbers game, a game of odds for fentanyl smugglers who are keenly aware that with so much traffic, U.S. Customs and Border Protection simply cannot inspect it all. It's a game of cat and mouse or finding that needle in the haystack. To find the drugs, says Laredo Border Security Coordinator Alberto Perez, federal officers rely on a wide-ranging toolbox, from high-tech gadgetry to human gut instinct. Hello, that begins with the initial meet and greet. They're looking for those signs of deception. Uh, so they're trying to key in on those little cues that are going to raise those red flags. That's going to cue the officer to say, hey, I need to look at this vehicle a little bit more closely. Take this Volkswagen bug. The front trunk won't open. So it's off to a secondary inspection where officers give the entire car a more thorough exam. So right now he's um, using our fiber optic scope you know, within the gas tank, trying to find the anything that sticks out, any anomaly that shouldn't be in the gas tank. It's just one piece of technology CBP officers use. There are giant x-ray machines to run vehicles through, and density meters too. Much like a stud finder, they can identify pack drugs behind a car's outer wall. Add to that low-tech mirrors to check the underside and high-powered noses from four-legged feds. Smugglers will try and hide their goods just about anywhere. We've seen tires, we've seen bumpers, seen quarter panels with car batteries, car seats, car floors, car roofs. So basically anything and anywhere, any crevice a vehicle has, they'll try to put it in there. Fentanyl is not like other drugs crossing the border. What makes fentanyl different? What makes it different is really you can smuggle a small amount of fentanyl into the United States and you're going to be able to make more money off of that than you would cocaine or, you know, uh, heroin. Less is Less more. Less is more. And that makes your job harder. Correct. Federal agents tell us that Mexican cartels are buying raw ingredients from China and shipping them here to Mexico, where they're creating fentanyl in clandestine labs that have no quality control, no pharmaceutical standards, basically making it in bathtubs and garages and back alley drug labs. And then they hire runners to bring it up north, playing the odds they won't undergo a full-blown inspection. Which brings us back to that Volkswagen with a jammed front trunk. After about 10 minutes of trying, they finally get it open, but there's nothing inside. If there was, the substance would go here for on-site testing and seizure of the drugs. We do not know what we have until we find out what we have. And they have been confiscating more and more. Over the past three fiscal years, fentanyl seizures by CBP nationwide have tripled from just under 5,000 to nearly 15,000 pounds. And every day brings more cars and trucks, thousands more on this bridge alone. It's impossible to do 100%. Another day of catch me if you can. It's a numbers game, yes. I think they're trying to exploit the, the fact that you have all this traffic in order to try to smuggle these narcotics into the U.S. The fentanyl that does make it through 
is killing in record numbers. More than 2,000 Texans died from fentanyl last year alone. But it's not just the numbers. One Houston filmmaker is making sure of that. Beyond all the technical know-how and video production skills he's honed over the years, Glenn Muse has a deep passion for what he does. I'm a storyteller. It's important to share stories. Everybody grows when a person shares a story. Come over here. So when the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration asked Muse to tell the stories. It's like the worst thing that like we'll ever go through. Of those who lost loved ones to the fentanyl crisis. It was one pill. Well, that pill cost him his life. They shared their hearts. All I kept saying was, oh my God, no, oh my God. And bared their souls. When we got there, the cops were already there, the detectives. But I'm like, where's Kaysen? Where's Kaysen? It's like, he's gone. He's gone. And I'm like, where? They, they said, he's laying on the living room floor. I probably cry a little bit with every story when I'm working on it. At the home office of his company, Texas Pictures, Muse, painstakingly edits the stories himself. You know, that's how he was. We really connect with them. That connection and personalization triggered a huge response. And when we put them on our YouTube channel, they, they took off. In a big way, the Texas Pictures fentanyl poisoning series has gotten more than 7 million views so far. Did you ever think? No, 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 no clue. Totally blown away when it when it took off. What do you chalk it up to? It's the topic. Well, fentanyl is, so many of the comments that we've seen are from people who are saying, me too. They're saying, I lost a son or daughter, I lost a friend, I lost a brother to this same thing. So Now families are reaching out to Muse and Texas Pictures <laughs> on their own. Thank you for letting me get all that out to share their stories, too. Talking brings healing. And what initially began as a collection of 16 tributes to those who died from fentanyl has now grown to more than 40 online. There are parents whose children suffered from long-term addiction. When the rehab driver showed up to pick him up, unfortunately, he was deceased in his hotel room. And there are parents whose kids were just experimenting with pills. Kids, instead of learning from their mistakes or experiences, you know, and moving on with life, they're dying. My soul died. I am dead. I'm dead on the inside. We asked them why. Why share their most personal, most painful moment in life for all to see? Just have another child. I couldn't save mine, so I'm trying to save yours. I don't want anybody else to feel what we have felt. It's simply our goal to save the next kid. That advocacy and awareness from many who've sat in front of the camera comes with a resounding message. Everybody thinks not my kid. It's not going to happen to my kid. I'll admit, maybe I was also thinking, OK, not my family, not me, not, my, not, not anybody I know. Don't ever say that. Not my child, not my child, because I'm sitting here today. I would have never thought my honor roll student, football player, athlete, would not be here today. Never thought. They are pleas that hit home, raw and real, captured through the lens of a storyteller moving the needle in the fight against fentanyl. It has to have touched some lives. Somewhere, somewhere there's got to be one person who's alive because they saw what we did. So how are kids getting their hands on these pills? Police tell me it's not like the old days where deals only went down on the street corner or in the shadows. Now hundreds of dealers are right here, just a click away. For this undercover narcotics detective. I mean, the phones are everything. Police work has changed. Their phone is 
gold to us because that's where all of the information is going to that's going to be that leads us to where they got the drugs that made them die. From death investigations to working drug cases proactively, he says some of the best leads and evidence are found on social media. This is an individual kind of just posting his uh, daily menu. It's a smorgasbord of drugs that often includes pressed pills. Pills the Montgomery County Narcotics Enforcement Team, or MOCONET, knows often contain deadly fentanyl. They'll post something on the Snapchat and it'll say, I've got blues, which could be Percocets. Buying drugs nowadays can be as easy as ordering a pizza. Hey, I've got this, this, and this. Just hit me up. I'll get you whatever you need. And they do that all day long, 365. It would seem impossible to track all of it, all day, every day. But we found one company a few miles from the San Diego coast Dr. Mackey. trying to do just that. Good to see you, Tim. Yeah. Jeremy Rigotti. Dr. Tim Mackey is CEO of S3 Research. We're looking at millions of posts and millions of types of data from different platforms. One platform's data looks different than another platform's data. And so the problem is there's too much data, to be honest. There's too much drug selling going on. That's where machine learning, a form of artificial intelligence, comes into play. Computer servers on site and in the cloud work around the clock to flag thousands of drug-related keywords. And so we collect that data. We use our machine learning to classify that data for the, those people who are explicitly selling. And then we visualize it so that different clients can use that information to take action. So this is our dashboard. Lead uh, threat analyst uh, Matthew Nally gave us a peek at what all that computer muscle churns out. Tens of thousands of illicit drug sales. These are the top 10. That can be ranked by who's posting the most, mapped to track drug selling clusters, and sorted by each social media platform. Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, uh, Dark Web, and Google Groups. It all gets archived so there's a record of what went on. And the drug selling posts range from the out in the open, nothing to hide variety, to more cryptic advertising using emojis, even QR codes, whatever the method and messaging. It's literally a, res a restaurant menu of drugs. But it's one thing to identify drug sales and another to do something about it. We do see a lot of accounts that are removed. They pop back up, they remove, they pop back up, they remove, pop back up. It's a whack-a-mole issue, he says. Here's why. A lot of platforms are going to take different strategies to removing content. The bigger problem is that the platforms are not always coordinating with each other. Which leads to a deeper question. Do social media companies really want to police drug sales? Snapchat has signed on for Mackey services, but pitches to other companies, he says, have gone nowhere. This is not uh, something that's easy to sell. You know, going to a platform and saying, hey, you might have a drug problem and we can help you find drug dealers on your platform. Given all that, why still do it? It's an interesting question. Um, Part of it is to put myself out of business. So we're in it for the end game. What I'd like to do is to wake up someday and not have to deal with having drug selling online ever again. Until then, the work of Dr. Mackey and his team continues. So who are the dealers on the other end of a smartphone? And if they know the fentanyl pills they're pushing are killing their clients, why keep selling them? One Texas mom got a real feel for that after her son Cameron died. This is Becky Stewart's story, in her own words. Cameron struggled. You would never have known this happy-go-lucky, funny, funny, funny kid was really struggling immensely on the inside. He had depression, anxiety, and instead of choosing to you know, cope with those mental health issues in a positive way, Cameron made an incredibly poor choice to buy a pill off of Snapchat and it contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. So found out after Cameron died and after his funeral, we kind of put two and two together and figured out who the guy was. And he's facing 20 to life. Found out he was at Cameron's funeral and posted RIP, we lost a good one. And the very next post was a handful of pills for sale. These dealers know that if their pill causes a death, those that are already addicted to it are going to know they have the good stuff. My stuff killed somebody. Come get it. He continued to make posts after that point. Feds are on my ass. I'm still making bank. 
telling you know, in code where he was gonna be and what he had and how strong it was. He doesn't care if he gets caught. All he cares about is he's still making money because there is always gonna be a buyer right around the corner. The thoughts that go through your head as a parent when you read those things and know that your son's death didn't mean a thing. It's really hard to put into words the rage that you feel inside. Nothing I do past this point is gonna bring my son back. So no amount of hate or rage or um, any of that against him or towards him is gonna change my situation. So how can I turn that into a positive? Becky started a nonprofit, a change for Cam in her son's honor, and turned her pain into a passion for raising awareness. She's one of many parents refusing to sit on the sidelines as more die. Which brings us to rural Montgomery County, where you'll find more than a hobby or weekend project at the hands of Kenny Hall, much more than screws and wood. That's what it means when it's put together. You know, it's a way to remember them. They're not forgotten. Sarah Hall is Kenny's wife, and together they're on a mission to keep anyone from going through what they did with their boy Ethan. We're here at the barn feeding the horses, and we get a phone call that Ethan is unconscious at the house. They rushed home to find their street blocked off. And I still remember the paramedic coming up, and he knelt down in front of me, and I was thinking, no, no, no. No, you are not going to tell me this. This is not happening. Fentanyl was found in Ethan's system, the college student, aspiring musical artist, and loving son, dead at 22. It's, it's a bad dream. It's just a really bad dream. With time, Sarah and three other grieving moms found purpose in their pain. We wanted a way, a sort of a visual to show the amount of people that we have lost to overdose. And so began the Texas Memorial Walkway. The pictures are submitted to us online by a family member, a loved one. At first, the victims were all ages, dying from all types of drugs. But what's come in Sarah's inbox lately is a snapshot of a national trend. During the last year, it's almost all shifted to fentanyl. Really? And the ages? They're getting younger and younger. Kenny builds the wooden bases for the Memorial Walkway photos. I would love to not have to build any more of these ever because of what they represent. Each one means another 10 lives lost. And this is to maybe stop somebody from going through what we had to go through and to let people know that it can happen to anybody. And that's the message they take on the road as part of MCO, the Montgomery County Overdose Prevention Endeavor. It's going this way. Kathy Posey, who also lost her son, is in charge of putting it all together. They had beautiful lives. You can look at their eyes and you can see that they have hopes and dreams. They, you know, they didn't plan to die. One by one, a team of volunteers make the Memorial Walkway come alive. On this day, there's room for only 60 tributes, but at other events, they put up nearly 200 photos of those now gone. We need to educate, and the thing is, is I've seen a recent study that showed that a lot of kids, even though they've heard the word fentanyl, they don't realize how dangerous it is. But the hope when someone walks through, reading the stories, seeing the faces, there is a connection that one of these people could be your son, daughter, sister, brother, or you. It's powerful, it's somber, it's sometimes a little overwhelming and a little in your face. It's real, and that's what the message we're trying to send. It's real, it's really happening. You have got to be aware of what is going on. The grassroots efforts of MCO and others are gaining traction from their own communities to the state capitol, where new laws are on the way in the fight against fentanyl. Addressing the fentanyl crisis 
is an emergency item this session. From his State of the State address to a jam-packed One Pill Kills summit, Governor Greg Abbott has made the fentanyl crisis a priority. Everyone in Texas has a role to play if we are going to effectively combat the spread of deadly fentanyl across our state. At the Capitol, the governor's backing State Senator Joan Huffman's bipartisan bill. Members, we've reached a critical point. Which stiffens penalties up to a murder charge for dealers whose fentanyl kills and officially classifies fentanyl deaths as poisonings. Prior to that, it was just called um, accidental overdose a lot of times. The word accidental threw prosecutors off because they thought it was in, impossible to prove a murder or, or some type of intentional act. Huffman's also pushing for an overdose mapping app, requiring first responders to input cases to help track clusters in real time. Awareness is prevention. In the Texas House, Representative Terry Wilson's bill requires fentanyl education in schools starting in the sixth grade. Other bills would equip schools with life-saving Narcan a nasal spray that can reverse the effects of fentanyl. Fentanyl testing strips are readily available. And there's a bipartisan bill to make fentanyl test strips, now considered drug paraphernalia, legal in Texas. Tom Oliverson's the author, and he's not just a lawmaker. I'm a board-certified anesthesiologist. So you know a thing or two about fentanyl. I use it every day on my patients. The pharmaceutical fentanyl he uses is made in a real lab. What's in the stuff sold on the street is anyone's guess. Right now in Texas, there's no way to legally know what you're getting. That's what we're trying to change. When we're dealing with something this potent and this potentially deadly, perhaps awareness is really the only chance of survival that you have. Fentanyl is deadly. It is spreading and Texas is fighting back. Everyone has a role to play in fighting the fentanyl crisis. There is no single solution, no one size fits all. But as the death toll continues to climb, one thing is abundantly clear. Doing nothing is not an option. That's what I learned the most putting this project together. Not only as a journalist, but as a dad. We have to talk about this with our loved ones. I hope you will with your family, your friends, not tomorrow or the next day, right now.